Hi, I'm Niels Berglund. I want to wish you all a good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time zone you're in. Also, welcome to Data Platform Virtual Summit 2021. I hope you've had a great conference so far. Yes, the summit is virtual and this presentation is recorded. But while the recording is running, I am online and I can, if you have questions, I will answer them. Just enter them in your in the uh, question box or the chat box. Cool. So let's get going. So welcome to real-time user facing analytics using Apache Kafka and Azure Data Explorer. So I'm, as I said before, I'm Niels Berglund. I'm a software architect lead at the Ribco, sunny Durban, South Africa. And I am also a Microsoft Data Platform MVP. So this is what we're gonna talk about today. I'll talk a little bit about data, um, why we, we are all in a, a data uh, conference. So of course, we're gonna talk about data. We're gonna talk about user-facing real-time analytics and look at what is that? Um, you have probably heard about real-time analytics, but what is user-facing real-time analytics? Then we'll go on and start discussing Apache Kafka, uh, Apache Kafka and Confluent Cloud. From there on, let's talk about Azure Data Explorer. And when we now have laid the foundation, knowing a little bit about Apache Kafka and Confluent Cloud, we can and Azure Data Explorer, we can now look at how do we now hook up Kafka with data with Azure Data Explorer. And then finally, when we hopefully get data coming into Azure Data Explorer, how do we query this real-time data? Cool. Bef so let's talk about data. And I have here some quotes around data just to show the importance, in my mind, the importance of data. So civilization has always run on data. Yes, I mean, Moses came down if you believe in this, and he had his tablets with him. And was, that wasn't iPads, but it was stone tablets which had data inscribed into them. And we all know that everything we do today is based upon data. Everything we do generates data. So, and data in itself has become a renewable resource. It's not like oil, which we uh, eventually will run out of data will just continue to be produced, right? And we have seen that even when trade slow, slows down, right? I mean, the last year and a half, almost two years, we've had COVID, but the amount of data, the volume of data has not gone down. It has probably increased. And all these quotes are from a book by Brad Smith. Brad Smith is the lead counselor at Microsoft. The book is called Tools and Weapons, The Promise and the Peril of the Digital Age. If you haven't read it, if you don't have it, go out and get it. It's a really, really good book. Cool. So we generate more and more data. It is estimated, I have no idea how people come up with these numbers, but it's estimated that in 2016, we had around 16.1 zettabytes of data. And this zettabyte is a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot. In 2025, we assume, we estimate that we will have 163 zettabytes worth of data. So that is a tenfold increase in, in nine years. So, and then what we do with this data becomes extremely important because we have to analyze the data. And we, we can't really afford not to, because if we do, well, then your competition comes in and we are losing. So, so, and also when we're analyzing the data, we need to ensure that we're doing it in real time or we'll try to do it in real time so that we can, act upon this data as soon as possible. And then now lately we've start, started talking about user-facing analytics and we'll see what that is uh, just now. So user-facing real-time analytics. Well, real-time is kind of, we kind of understand that, right? That is now or almost now. Now, sometimes we say near real-time, but it's, it's kind of now. User-facing though, what is that? Well, 
let's talk about analytics. Normally, when we think about analytics, we're thinking about potentially about BI, machine learning, data science. In an organization, you have some people, five, six, 10, I, I don't know how many that are doing this. The, the, the whole point here is that traditionally analytics has been done, has been done by a small group of people and the result of the analytics has been exposed to a fairly small group of people, i.e. the execs, the managers, what, uh, what have you. Now, user facing, that means that we are that we are exposing analytics to the end users, right? And we are allowing, allowing the end users to query the data, to get their own analysis, to do their own analysis potentially of the data. And here are some examples of this, where on the uh, left-hand side here, we, uh, we see uh, LinkedIn, who viewed your profile? And yeah, don't, don't worry about the numbers. I'm not that popular on LinkedIn. But the whole thing here is that, the whole thing here is that I am going to LinkedIn. I'm logging in, uh, into LinkedIn and I click who viewed your profile. And I see in real time, or almost real time, who has viewed my profile. So, so if I, I click on there now, and if I'm a popular guy, well, which you can see that I'm not, but if I'm a popular guy or girl, then if you click on 10, uh, well, a couple of minutes later, you can see how the, how the numbers have changed. And the thing is that in this analysis here, well, it is real time. And also we have to now be able to provide this for however many uh, users that LinkedIn has. So user-facing analytics is kind of has its own uh, challenges. On the on the right-hand side here, we're having a leaderboard from an online game, and since I'm from Derivco, online gaming is kind of is near and dear to my heart. And we, here as well, we can see now that this user A said who. Uh, uh, who is logged in, he is at the top of the leaderboard. And, and the thing is, right, that he wants to see, or when you log, when you click on the leaderboard, you will see what it looks like right now. So that, this is real time. And anyone, anyone that plays this game would be able to go in and look at the leaderboard. So, and, and that is a way to, to make games more popular, to gamify gaming, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? So the requirements and challenges with user facing real time is, is it's kind of special, right? So on the, on the left hand side here, we are seeing sort of the data coming in. So we need real time. The data is high, uh, has high dimensionality. In other words, have a lot of features compared to uh, the, the, the number of rows, the number of, of events that comes. And it is large volume. The velocity of data is very, very high. The, on the right hand side, we, we, the, the requirements we now have of this data that is being pushed in from the left hand side is that this should now be, the, uh, we should have very fresh data, seconds freshness. And also, we will have thousands and thousands of queries per second against this data. Think about the LinkedIn, right? Think about how many people that are on LinkedIn and wants to see how, how many has used, have viewed their profile. And we want this quick, 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 millisecond, milliseconds latency. And at the bottom here, this has to be highly available. I mean, I don't, if I'm playing an online game, well, I want to see the leaderboard as it is right now. It needs to be scalable. So when my user base increases, I should be able to scale out. And also, it, it's cool if it is cost effective. I mean, it can't cost an arm and a leg. So with that in mind, if we're going back to here, the left hand side, what, what, what systems can we think of that can give us this out of the box? And 
uh, Apache Kafka comes to mind. So Apache Kafka started LinkedIn. There were some guys and girls that wanted to replace their messaging system, and they came up with Kafka. They worked hard on it. They eventually realized that, hmm, this thing here, that, that seems cool. Maybe other people are interested in, interested in it. Excuse me. So they open source Kafka in 2011. Then three years later, or approximately three years later, the, found, the, the guys and girls that started the work at LinkedIn with Kafka, they went off and founded a company called Confluent in 2014. Confluent is now the commercial arm of uh, Kafka. Kafka is still open source. Confluent has their own Confluent platform that builds on the open source Kafka, and they add some enterprise-like functionality to it. And, and Kafka is a distributed streaming platform. We are publishing events, and they are now streaming into Kafka. There are records streaming into Kafka. These events are uh, persisted. And that is kind of cool because I now have the ability to go back and look at these events. And I can now process streams of records in real time. And the persistence here is we are persisting it into a commit log. And the, me as a database developer, well, originally the database developer, com logs are cool because logs are trustworthy. So I know personally when someone comes and tells me that something has gone wrong with an application that i am partly responsible for well my first response is that hey it works on my machine uh, yeah well actually no i don't say that anymore but my next response is that hey what does the log file say because i know the log file that is the truth and these logs in kafka they are distributed over multiple machines so we can scale it out and for and get performance and for resilience we are also replicating them right so here's uh, kafka 101 when we when we're talking about kafka there are certain certain things we need to know and we, we're talking about a kafka cluster we're talking about a Kafka broker, and a Kafka broker is essentially a server running Kafka. And even if you only have one server, you are still to, that is still in a cluster. The cluster has one server, has one broker. Then a broker has topics, and now it's getting interesting because topics is to where we are producing these messages. And topic is like a data, like a table in a database, and this topic has partitions exactly as you in the database world you can partition your table in in Kafka we are uh, partitioning the topic and when we are now publishing so we have a publisher coming in here from the left hand side he starts to publish and we're seeing here now how messages how events are flowing into the various partitions in the topic and we can see how messages flowing into partition zero has a light gray background the messages flowing into partition one has a yellowish background and messages flowing into partition two has a light blue background and the the way kafka defines where to put these messages is based upon the color well that is not entirely true, but it, they base it upon a key. So when you are publishing, you're assigning a key to your message. And then Kafka is doing some smartness, hashing, modulus, and comes up to which partition a message comes in. We then talk about consuming. And when we're talking about consuming, we're talking about consumer groups. And we are saying in Kafka land, one instance of a we can only have one instance of a consumer group of a specific consumer group reading from one topic this but from, sorry reading from one partition in a topic the consumer group can uh, read from many topics many partitions but one partition can only have one instance of one specific 
consumer group reading from it. So we are seeing here that in the on the green uh, on the right hand side here, the green is consumer group one. We have two instances. The uppermost instance uh, reads from partition zero and one, and the uh, lower uh, instance reads from partition two. We then have a second consumer group, and there we only have one instance. And that instance reads now from all three partitions. Cool. So let's go on and have a demo. So in this demo, we're going to have a look at uh, Kafka. So let's bring up something called the, um, uh, the control center. That's a uh, web UI uh, for Kafka. So first I need to uh, log in and I'm logging in with my email address and I'm running Kafka in Confluent Cloud. So Confluent Cloud is the uh, Confluent Cloud is a managed service running the running Kafka and I'm running this on uh, on Azure we can see that I have a, a cluster. Uh, I have an environment called the default environment, and I have a cluster here, test cluster one. If I click on test cluster one, we can, on the left hand side here, we're seeing an overview, we see data flow, we see topics, and I won't go into what this, what all this is, but let's have a look at topics, right? And when I click on topics, we can see that I have here quite, well, not, not that many, but I have some topics here. And we, we uh, scrolling down, we can see here a two topics called majors and majors two, and uh, that's what we're going to use here. Right? So let's click on uh, the majors topic and let's click on messages and uh, this tab here gives me a view of what the message is coming into the topic and i can also go in and look at previous messages so let's try to uh, let's try to uh, to publish some messages to this topic so i have here also a uh, .net and uh, .net application which publishes wagers or publishes events. So uh, Derivco is on in the online gaming. We are having wagers and this uh, application now publishes wagers to this particular uh, topic. So we can see here I have send message. Um, I'm saying produce async to the topic which I'm sending in in send message. So uh, this is kind of like a test harness. So, and here in this um, this file is just a setting file saying how many spins I should do and things like that. So th that has nothing to do with this. But let's say thousand spins. And uh, cool. Let's make sure that that is saved. Let's go in here and uh, do a restore and then do a build cool and now uh, let's hit f5 here to start to generate messages so we are things are happening we can see here how uh, messages has been generated and now when i go into here I should see messages coming in here, as we can see. And we can see here how, uh, how messages are being uh, produced to, well, actually everything now comes into the same partition, uh, which is a little bit strange. Anyway. Things comes into the same partition and off it goes. So messages are flowing in here. That's cool. Right. Uh, let, uh, let's run this one. Uh, so now we have seen a little bit about topics and producing messages. 
So the other thing is if we are now, we now have a Kafka broker in here. And I may want to, I may want to produce messages into this broker, but I don't have a .NET application, I don't have a Java application, whatever. So Kafka has something called Kafka Connect, and Kafka Connect is a way to connect source system with Kafka, or connect Kafka with target systems. Right. And uh, that wasn't very smart of me. And then what we have here. So now we have in a Kafka Connect worker process. And we have something called connectors. And we have source connectors. And we have sync connectors. And the source connector gets data from the source system. Right. Pushes it to Kafka, to topics. And the sync connector on this side here, right? The sync connector grabs data from the topics and pushes it to sync systems. And we'll see an example of that later when we're talking about Azure Data Explorer. The final thing about Kafka here is KSQL DB. And KSQL DB is what we call an event streaming DB. And it allows us to build stream processing application where we can use where the where the publisher right pushes data into a topic we're having ksql db servers that reads data off topics it applies some stream processing and in um, the uh, in in the ksql db has a sql like syntax so you're saying select star from something where something equals something etc cetera, etc cetera, and it processes it in here and pushes it to another topic where we then can have oops uh, there is something wrong here that should obviously say a consumer cool and the ksql db really lowers the bar for implementing streaming So we have now seen here how on the left-hand side we can get into Kafka. But here, when we now want data with seconds freshness, thousands and thousands of queries per second, and a millisecond latency, what do we use to do that? Uh, so yes, we could definitely use KSQL DB, but these thousands of queries per second is probably not suitable. Uh, KSQL DB is probably not suitable for that. And we may want to do more, uh, more advanced queries than what we can do in KSQL DB. Don't get me wrong. KSQL DB is awesome, absolutely awesome. But for, for, for certain requirements, uh, we need something else. And then, as this talk is about Apache Kafka and Azure Data Explorer, that's something else is Azure Data Explorer. Right, so Azure Data Explorer. Well, data, Azure Data Explorer is a, a tool, a system for big data analytics. It is it's extremely performant and we are using, you can scale it quite easily, and we use it for typically data exploration, uh, log, telemetry data, but in reality, any type of data that is fast moving. So it, it helps to handle um, a, quite a wide vari variety of streams that comes in from software, from modern software, once again, IoT, telemetry, logs, uh, real-time events in general. And it is, it is ideal when we are using it for large volumes, large volumes of diverse data, a lot of data from many different sources. So it is originally this was called Custo or Custo, 
Um, yeah, let's not go in why it's called that, but there is a story behind it. And the cool thing here is that you can work with any kind of data, structured, semi-structured, unstructured, free text, what have you. You can work with all of that and you can query all of that. And uh, Azure Data Explorer has very smart ways of dealing with all this data. High velocity. Remember uh, back when we said that uh, we wanted um, our systems had to handle high velocity, uh, lots and lots of lots of data per second, low latency in in the seconds range, and we also need so if we now can do this and we can now push that data into Azure Data Explorer, we also need to be able to query this in a in a rich and powerful way. So we can do simple queries from um, keyword searches. We can do time series analysis. Uh, we can do behavioral an analysis. It has built-in machine learning stuff. So we can do a lot of very cool stuff with it. And the, the query language, it is not SQL, but it's something similar. The, the main use cases here for, for Azure Data Explorer is data exploration. Right? So we're getting uh, lots of data in. We want to look at the data, see if we can see trends, etc. We want to do, or we want to do real-time analytics. We want to do the LinkedIn's, uh, who has viewed your profile, or we want to do a leaderboard. And and the, the third uh, main use case here is, is fast moving data, real time data, time series. Right. So if we're looking at this whole big data environment, big data world, we, we are seeing here how we on the left hand side, right, we're having a lot of data that is being pushed in it's ingested into something, right? And we eventually want to store it or we want to uh, do, um, we want to do a machine learning analysis, etc., etc. In between here, we have an exploration phase. And this is now where Azure Data Explorer really shines. So the data comes in fairly high velocity. We are now querying the data. We, we can look at the data as it passes it through, and we can also store it down here into a big data store. So the architecture of uh, Azure Data Explorer looks something like so. So we, we, we have a cluster, right? So we have a, and uh, we have a cluster and the cluster have one or more databases, right? Nothing strange so far. The database databases has one or more tables. Right. And the tables are storing data in extents, in shards. And that's where the, the power of Azure Data Explorer comes in. It, it's this whole notion of sharding of extents. And all this now runs in the cloud. In addition, in the database, we can have functions. We can have materialized views and we have indexes the indexes is if you are a uh, well, database guy or girl you are used to creating indexes yourself you don't do that in azure data explorer azure data explorer handles that for you and it has some very very smart and cool ways of indexing your data that is that in itself is a topic for another talk so once again, the architecture here, we're, 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 having the, we're having the cluster, right? 
Uh, and in the cluster, we're, we're having databases. We have tables, functions, materialized views is not here, but we have materialized views as well. All this runs on, uh, on nodes, on virtual machines, virtual machine nodes. And we have a storage that is Azure Blob storage. Right. So that, that's how kind of it is being, that's the architecture. We don't really need to worry about this whole part because this is just managed for us by Azure. So we have in, in when we're spinning up Azure Data Explorer, there are two services, two main services, uh, services in Azure Data Explorer. We have an engine service and we're having a data management service. And the engine service is takes the raw incoming data, it's doing things with it, and it then pushes it into storage. And it also serves up uh, user queries through an API. So when we are querying, when we are querying Azure Data Explorer, we are querying it through an API. Uh, the data management service is managing the data, surprise, surprise, as the name implies. And the data management service is connected to the engine service, and it connects the engine service to various data pipelines. And it's the data management service that handles ingestion of the data. So when we are ingesting data into Azure Data Explorer, we are ingesting it into the data management service and the data management service call in, well, passes the data to the engine, serv uh, to the engine service. So, and it looks a little bit like, like this, right? That we are, getting data once again looks a little bit like the previous um, previous picture but we are getting data here right that data is now can be um, well uh, azure data factory applications this is what we are interested in kafka it can be iot hub uh, azure iot hub and it can be uh, Azure Event Hub as well as Azure Event Grid, right? And these are all now connected in one way or another to the data management service. And the way we are ingesting here is that we can ingest in a stream base, like, like here, or we ingesting batch, uh, batch base. Uh, and uh, the, the it's the pipelines that defines the uh, ingestion types, whether it is stream based or whether it is batch based. And then the data management service here pushes that data to the engine. The engine pushes it into a uh, blob store. It also stores data in memory or on local SSDs. And then we have applications that queries this data through APIs. Cool. So now we have data, hopefully. Hopefully we have data in, in uh, Azure Data Explorer. How do we query this? Well, we're using something called the Custo query language, KQL, KQL, sorry. And it is similar to SQL, but slightly different. It's same, same, but different. We are using the pipe character here to pipe commands from one to another. And when we're doing equality, well, the equality is equal equals. We can do here when we are querying, as I, we said before, we, we can do full text indexing, time series analysis. We have built-in machine learning features. We have a enormous variety of things that we can, that is built into Azure Data Explorer that, that we can use to query our data. Right, so... Let's uh, take time out for a little demo here. Okay, so the demo done. Let's have a look at Azure uh, Data Explorer. 
So what I'll do is I'll go to my Azure portal. Um, I'm in my uh, dashboard and to the left here, I we can see how I have an Azure Data Explorer uh, clustered pinned to my dashboard. So let's uh, click on that one. And now I can see here. So this is now my uh, Data Explorer cluster. And in my Data Explorer cluster, we can see that I have three databases. Let's see if we can maybe screw, zoom in. So Niels uh, BAD Extreme, Niels B Test DB, and Niels DB uh, One. Right? I I don't have any imagination. That's why we have these duff duff names on it. But anyway. Cool. So having looked at that, we can also see here on the uh, left hand side in the menu, I have something called query. So let's uh, let's click on query and see what uh, what that gives us. And that now takes me into my uh, my cluster that we see here. Right. And I have a here I have an, one database connected to this, my Niels test DB. And I can now go in here and um, Niels test DB. I can go in and do something like, so we have a table called wagers. I can do uh, wagers dot, sorry, count and like that and then we run and we have 297,730 entries in there but uh, we'll look at this uh, database and table in in a little bit let's instead go and have a so this is now where you can query using um, your azure portal you also have the ability to query using azure data studio I, I won't gonna do that uh, here, but we have a third option and that to use something called the Custo Explorer, um, which is purpose built for uh, Azure Data Explorer. And in here, what we're gonna do, we're gonna look at an uh, well, test cluster or help cluster called uh, Demo 12. And in there we have a uh, we have a database called GitHub, and if we are expanding the GitHub, we can see that we have. Sorry, uh, we can see that we have two tables: events from live stream and GitHub event. Right? And what we're going to look at is the GitHub event uh, table. So here I have a. So the way we are querying with uh, with Castor Query language is we're starting with the uh, we're starting with the table GitHub event, and then we're saying what we want to do. We're doing a pipe and what we want to do. So here we're saying GitHub event count. Let's run that, and we'll see here we have. 1,256,776,842 entries into that table. Uh, cool. So the the other thing is the, the only really half weird thing with KQL is that when you're doing aggregations, some count, etc., you are using a uh, you are using a statement called summarize. So what we want to do in this statement here is we want to look at the max value of when this entry was created at and the mean value when this was created at. And this GitHub event is, uh, is we have loaded in whatever has happened in GitHub into this database. And when we're looking at this, and uh, when we're querying that, we are now querying 1.2 billion rows, 
and that was qu quite quick. So we're saying that we're, we have started this on 1st of January 2016, or these events are from 1st of January 2016, and up until 5th of uh, February 2019. Right. The the other cool one very cool thing here with um, with GitHub with um, with the custom query language and these editors is that we can uh, visualize the data. So here we're now saying uh, GitHub event summarize. We are um, grouping what we are grouping it by when things have happened and then we are rendering a time chart once again 1.2 billion records and now here we can see our chart Let's give it a little bit bigger. So we're seeing how we started here in 2016. Uh, here we're seeing holiday periods. This was around Christmas, New Year, Christmas, New Year, Christmas, New Year. All right. And how long did that take us to do? It took a quarter of a second to do all of this. And we see that. We see that here. Right, very very cool. Um, okay, let's see what what this looks like. So we say in GitHub event take ten. I uh, select top ten essentially. Well, select uh, yeah, uh, top ten, and we can see here that we have some columns which are normal columns with normal uh, data types, but then we have a couple of here that contains um, contains JSON, for example. Right, so the the actor column in here and we can see we uh, among here we have a display login uh, michael something right so let's see what else we can do with uh with kql right so let's let's do this let's this is now saying this is now going into that json and grabbing the display login that we saw here all right. So let's do that. Whoa, wrong. Uh, let's do that, and off we go. And here we're going now. The ten. Uh, we're just taking ten here of these 1.2 billion. Now we have gone into this actor column, parsed the JSON, and come up with the various login names. Very cool. Finally, what we're going to do is we're going to do a count, a distinct count to see how many logins we have and, how, uh, and what they have done. So run that once again, 1.2 billion rows. And now it took a little while. It took essentially, well, to almost uh, almost three seconds to do a distinct over 1.2 million and account and see how many distinct logins we have and that came out to 16 million four hundred twenty thousand five hundred ninety seven sixteen thousand sixteen million four hundred twenty four hundred twenty one thousand something like that and here we see now the uh, the strength, the performance of um, of Azure Data Explorer and KQL. How we can query and do do stuff against the data in a very very performant way. Cool. Um, so uh, we have seen the sa sample syntax. Very very cool. Um, right. What do we then do? Let's see this in a real world example. So, so up until now, we have seen, we have spoken about data, we have spoken about user facing, but nothing what we have done here is really user facing, right? We have spoken about Kafka and we have gotten a, an insight into Azure Data Explorer. So let's have a real world example. So 
the real world example here that we're going to talk about is, is something that is close to what we do at Derivco. So you may not know it, but we are doing online gaming. And in an online game, we have people betting, <clears throat> betting, they are wagering, they are placing bets. And we're having thousands and thousands of people doing this. And with all this, it can be interesting to see, to create, for example, a leaderboard. So to see who has won the most, who has uh, wagered, who has done most spins on a particular game, etc., etc. Another use case could be here that we are looking at the popularity of a game, that we, we want to see what game is the most popular, what game has the most people playing that game. Another use case could potentially be to look at uh, anomalies. Does this game uh, pay out too little? Does this game pay out too much? Etc. Etc. So we could do potentially do like time series analysis on it. And we can now we can now uh, publish these events, these major events to Kafka. That is cool. Then we want from, from Kafka, we want to ingest this into Azure Data Explorer. And then when we have the data in Azure Data Explorer, well, then we want to do some magical things with that to, to achieve all what we just said, leaderboards, um, game anomalies, uh, what, uh, what game is most popular, et cetera, et cetera. The question then, is as we have here on the on the slide what is the what how do we ingest this uh, big fat question mark here how do we ingest the data into azure data explorer sure we could i i could write a uh, i could write an application here so this question mark is Nils's application that reads data off uh, the Kafka topic and then pushes it into uh, the data manager and the data manager pushes it to the engine. Yeah? But we, we, earlier, in this, uh, earlier in this presentation, we spoke about Kafka Connect and how Kafka Connect allows us to do things with us having to do very much coding ourselves. So I'm a lazy guy. I don't want to write much code if I, if I can avoid it. So can Kafka Connect help us? And the answer to that is yes, because we have, we have a custo sync connector. In other words, remember uh, the slide way back when, where we looked at Kafka Connect and how we on the right hand side had uh, sync connectors that read data from a Kafka, uh, Kafka topic and ingested it into a target system. And that's what we're having here. We're having the cast to sync connector that reads data from a topic and ingests it into a Azure Data Explorer. When we are, this doesn't come straight out of the box in Kafka Connect. So what we need to do, we need to deploy it to Kafka Connect. And there are various ways we can do this. We, we in Kafka Connect, the, the worker process, has some well-known parts where it is reading um, which it can load connectors from so we could potentially manually copy it into that uh, into the path and we spin up the connector and it finds this connector we confluent have something called cl client hub install client hub install where we can with one line or two lines of code we can tell kafka connect to install this connector or finally what we can do is we can we can take a base image in, in docker we can take a docker base image and then from that image build a new connect image, including this custom sync connector. And that is what I have done. I have taken a, <clears throat> excuse me, I have taken a base image, I have added the custom sync connector to the base image, built it and pushed it up to an Azure container uh, instance. Uh, 
And but before we can use start using this sync connector, we have to configure the connector so that it knows where to read from and where to ingest the, uh, into. Right. The before, however, we can set up the before we can con, uh, configure the, the connector, we need to ensure that Azure Data Explorer is ready. We need to set up Azure Data Explorer for this. And if we look down here at the bottom of the slide, this is what the event looks like that we are pushing into Kafka. So we're having an event ID, we're having an event time, we're having a module ID, etc., etc., etc. Right? And that is now what we want to go into. What we want to go into Azure Data Explorer. So what we want to do, actually, instead of having it here on the slides, let's have a look at, at some code. Uh, so I go back to Custo Explorer because I have already set this up. Uh, so we can see here that I am now in my uh, in my uh, Niels B A D X test cluster and the Niels B test database. And what I have done is I have created a table, and this create table looks more or less like you would create like you would define a table in, in SQL in T SQL. Create table, table name, the uh, column names, uh, the data types, etc., etc., etc. That's cool. Um, but now, now we have this table and we will have something coming in from the outside world ingesting into that table. The format of this data is JSON as we saw in the, in the slide. So, and Azure Data Explorer or the data manager doesn't really know how to handle this JSON. So what we are doing is we're setting up a mapping we are saying here, create table wagers ingestion. Um, and we are saying for ingestion, we're having a JSON mapping. And JSON mapping, we are now giving it a name. It's just a name, and you will see in a little bit how we are using it. And then we go on and say here how to map this. So we have the column event ID that we had from up here, right? The column uh, event ID in the table. We've, maps to a property in my JSON, which is called event ID. The column user ID maps to a property called user ID, so on and so forth. Right? And now I have this mapping. Finally, what we're doing here is we are creating a policy for ingestion. So when we are when we are using the custom sync connector, we are using batch ingestion. Remember uh, a couple of slides, well, five, six, ten slides ago, and we spoke about how from these data sources we are ingesting into the data manager, and we're having two types of ingestions. We're having uh, stream ingestion, and we're having batch ingestion. Ingestion, and the uh, custom connector is using batch ingestion and here we are setting up just for performance reason we are setting some properties how big how, what is the time span between batches how many uh, items should be in a batch etc 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 cool when we have done that then we are ready for this let's let's just go to uh, the application we saw before and uh, restart it um, and start ingesting into start ingesting into um, yeah, Azure Data Explorer or rather push events to Kafka and then from there ingest into, da into Azure Data Explorer so let's start this up again and as soon as we can see that we have started and here we go we're seeing how we are creating events and how we are pushing events etc etc cool so now now we have set up we have created the table we have set up the mapping and we have edited the ingestion policy right. and that's what we just have done cool and now what we do is we want to configure the connector. So uh, as I said before, 
somewhere I should have my Postman collection. I have it here. So as I said before, I'm running this connector in um, as, as a container in an ACI Azure Container uh, image. And what we can do, let's have a look here. Right. So here is the IP address. And we are hitting the 8083 endpoint, which is the well-known endpoint for Kafka Connect. And let's first see what connectors we have available. Let's call send here. We're doing a get on co against connector plugins. Awesome. Uh, call send. And here we see, yeah, we actually have our the sync connector and we have some other connectors that are that we are not interested in, uh, at, in at the moment they come as part of the base image that I used to create this uh, my image right so uh, then what we are doing we're saying uh, we are hitting a post request once again against that IP and in that post request we are now defining certain things and before I uh, tell you all my secrets let's go back to this slide and we can see here so we're saying that we are creating a connector uh, we are giving it a name, custom sync connector. We're saying among from the connectors that now exist in this image, which which is the connector class, and that is what you see here. Come Microsoft, yada yada yada, connect sync custom sync connector. We're saying what topic from to write from. Uh, at the moment, this is not correct. We are writing from we are reading from Vagers instead of Vagers two, but that is neither here nor there. Uh, we are telling the connector where the actual, where it should ingest to, where it can query from. We're doing some authentication stuff. Uh, this part here is important. Here we're defining the topics mapping. In other words, uh, we are here saying what topic we are reading from. Uh, we are saying which DB we are hitting and so on and so forth. Uh, the table is wagers, it is JSON, and then finally over here we're having the mapping, the wagers JSON mapping. Cool. And then we can now post this and we can see, let's go back to Postman, we can see here now get configured connectors where we're saying once again we're hitting my endpoint, port 8083, connectors, and we are uh, getting it and woohoo right here we have it my cast sync connector vagers is there that's awesome all right so yeah sorry right so here is now we have configured configured the connector and now if uh, if the demo gods are with us and we have started the production, we have started the publishing of the events. We should now be publishing events into the topic looking like that. And we should be able to query these events. Right. So go back to Custo Explorer. Uh, go to here. Let's have a look at the count of the bets, wagers, the bets coming in. We run it. So here we now have, uh, whoa, sorry, uh, 336,000, and that's quite a lot more than what we had previously. All right. Um, we should be able to do something like this. So we're saying wagers, order by event time, and we are taking the, the top 1,000, ordering it by event time descending. We're uh, highlighting and we are running it. Um, cool. Uh, so uh, event time 17.03. Uh, so that was like uh, three minutes ago. Um, so data should be coming in. I hope. 
Uh, let's look at Vader's count again. So 336,914. Let's uh, copy that just so we remember. Uh, let's run it again. Whoa. Well, if we're doing it the right way. And now we're having 337,152. Uh, 337, 337, Big numbers are, are hard, right? What we now then can do is, let, let's say that we want to uh, look the number of wagers for a 10 minute period based upon a module ID. So a module ID is how we are identifying a game. So each game has a different module ID. And we can now do something like that. Right. And here we're saying that the right. So now we could have something here, a showing the most popular game. So the 126 uh, has a count of 125, 138 has a count of 123, etc., etc. So that's one way. We could also look at in a uh, in a chart. And yeah, I don't know how how useful this is, but at least we can see here that 134. Uh, 426, etc., etc. Right? We can also look at users who has wagered the most against a module ID, and this is now a typical leaderboard scenario. That uh, think back to one of the first slides we had in this user-facing uh, real-time analytics. We saw a leaderboard. And uh, let's see if we're getting something here. Cool. So we now have an uh, user ID 1000 has wagered on this module ID that amount. We, uh, what else can we do here? Uh, that was a stupid. Uh, I had a hard coded date in there. Let's take it uh, 10 minutes. And here we're now seeing that user ID uh, uh, 10,006, module ID 10,047, etc. Et um, what else? Yeah, so, so that's kind of what, what we can do here. And we can now see how we can have an API call executing these queries and getting a result coming back. So we now have, we are now actually doing a user facing analysis where the individual users can get their data. There we are. We have done a demo of this. So to finish this off, we're getting more and more data. We have to analyze the data. Otherwise, yeah, otherwise we're dead. And we want to do the analysis in real time or as close to near real time as we can come. And if I can give the end user the ability to query something to do his own analysis or at least give a result back to him will be a lot better than I have than him not being able to do it. Uh, Apache Kafka is the, is the de facto standard for streaming. And we spoke about KSQL DB, we spoke about Kafka Connect, we said a little bit about Azure Data Explorer, who, which is a big data analytics platform, KQL, query language for ADX, for Azure Data Explorer, and we have the Custos Sync Connector that connects Kafka with Azure Data Explorer. And that's what we've been talking about here today. Right, so thank you boys and girls, that was that. Remember, I'm here online with you. Please post questions 
and I'll try to answer them. And I will also be in the virtual lounge afterwards, so we can hook up, talk, share a virtual drink or something. So thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Bye. Thank you.